My name is Amy Buecher. I am a psychologist by training. So I earned my PhD at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor in 2006 in psychology. And most of my peers, when you're in a PhD program, um, does anyone here have a PhD? So you know, you're, you're basically trained to become an academic depending on the field that you're in. In psychology, that's very much the case. Uh, but I had realized at some point during grad school that I was learning all of this really cool stuff that could change people's lives for the better. And if I followed the traditional career path, I was going to end up writing papers that would be under review for a year, two years, three years, make it out into the academic journal space, be read by some of my academic peers, and maybe be iterated on with additional research. And that wasn't what I wanted to do. I really wanted to start doing work that could more immediately touch people's lives. And at the same time, I thought technology was really cool, so um, it made sense for me to at leave academia and try to find uh, work elsewhere. And I, I was very, very lucky that after a few false starts, I found a startup in Ann Arbor that had spun out of the University of Michigan called Health Media. It was um, founded by Dr. Vic Strucker, and his big research insight was that personalizing digital health coaching made it much more effective. And so all of our programs ran on these algorithms that created really personalized experiences for people that got down to the barriers that they were facing with respect to behavior changes they were supposed to make. So I got the chance, as you do in a startup, to wear a lot of different hats, really quickly learn about different aspects of design and development and creating uh, programs and the business aspect of it, selling them. It was a B2B model. So I got to learn a lot there about you know when your customer is not your user. And um, that's kind of that's kind of history. So that's that's what I do now. I work on applying psychology to the design of mostly, but not totally, digital experiences. I'm at MadPow now, and um, I'm also working on a book that will be coming out with from Rosenfeld Media in early 2020. So I have a slide at the very, very end, but if you're interested in it, it goes into a lot more detail about the stuff I'm going to talk about tonight. And if you sign up on the mailing list, I'm told there will be discount codes when the book gets closer to publication. And it helps them know how many books to print, and I hope they want to print a lot of them. So. Please do that. So why is this important, this idea of behavior change? Well, your success may depend on your ability to change user behavior. And for many, many, many products, it really does. If you can't achieve results, your product will fail. It's supposed to do something. But the, the hard part here is how do you identify what really matters for changing customer behavior and design an experience that influences those factors? So the first thing that you, you really should be thinking about, and this is a little bit counterintuitive, but um, start from the end. And there's actually a recent book that Matt Wallert put out from Clover Health, if you've, if you've heard of him, called Start From The End, which is a great title. I'm a little jealous that he took it. But, but the idea is when you're, when you're starting off on a design project, you should really understand the outcomes that you're trying to achieve. This goes left to right in terms of a time frame, but really you're creating this from right to left. Because the very first thing you want to say is, what would this, what does success look like? What is the KPI, what is the metric that will tell me that the product I'm building is a success? So in the health field where a lot of my work is, a lot of times that comes down to two different things. It comes down to money. So are we, are patients spending less in their health care? Is the hospital spending less money caring for them? And it also comes down to biometrics. So are we seeing reductions in A1C if it's a person with diabetes? Are we seeing lower blood pressure? That kind of thing. The thing is, those sorts of outcomes take a really, really long time to happen, sometimes years. And so what you need to do then is think back over time. OK, in order to achieve those objectives, what has to happen? Well, people have to do something differently. And we have to figure out what those things are, because those are the things that we're going to want to change with whatever we build. And in order for us to deliver the intervention that changes those behaviors, we need people to participate and engage with whatever we build with our product. And before that, if we want to know what the change looks like, we have to establish some baseline measurements. And so you can basically fill out, this is, this is your starter map, and you can go through and spend the time to fill out each of these boxes with the very specific things that need to happen in order for your product to be a success. And for two of these boxes, at least, motivation is really needed. You're asking your user to do something differently, mostly of their own volition. Not always, but you probably should be doing it of their own volition in order to get to those outcomes at the end. And that, in a nutshell, is why motivation is really important. 
So motivation, a definition I like, is desire with velocity. And the reason I like this is because motivation is it's one of those terms that we use in daily life, but it also has a really specific meaning in psychological science. And the two definitions are not quite the same. So when we talk about it in daily life, you might say something like, I'm so motivated to lose weight. But you might not really be motivated to lose weight. You might just be motivated to look great in the, the dress that you want to wear to your high school reunion or wh whatever that you know, image is that you have in your head. Motivation is really about wanting to do something differently. And if it doesn't have a target, then it's really it, it, it's meaningless in terms of behavior change uh, design. So we really want to specify that target behavior up front. And that gets back to what I just showed here with this um, outcomes logic map, the behavior change box. Motivation takes that behavior change box as its target. So I, I think about motivation using a theory called self-determination theory. And one of its big contributions, self-determination theory is awesome. Um, Self-determinationtheory.org is a great website if you are interested in getting really into the nerdy details of it. You can read a lot of the original research papers there, and they have really nice summaries, and you can download scales and measurements. One of its main contributions is that it considers motivation really in a really nuanced way. It's not just low or high. I have very little or very much motivation. It talks about something called motivational quality. And motivational quality really matters in how well somebody is able to stick with the change over time. So I'm actually going to build this. On the left, you see what's called controlled forms of motivation. And the, the A motivated box is actually no motivation. So uh, a lot of times when I'm working and doing behavior change design, I don't even think about those people. They're not going to do anything. There, there's no way that they are going to be willing to participate in your product. Uh, and you'll hear me keep using the term intervention. That is the behavior science term for the product, the thing that you build that is intended to change behavior. So when you hear me say that, that's where that word is coming from. The A-motivated aren't going to go there. And in fact, if you pressure them and try to get them involved, what you're basically doing is putting them off ever becoming interested in trying it out. So I like to think of it as you may plant the seeds with them, let them know that this thing exists, but if they're not interested, say a graceful goodbye and let them know you'll be there if, and ever, if they're ever ready. Moving from there, you have your externally motivated. And if you've ever heard the term extrinsic motivation, that's what this refers to. So there may be some sort of reward or punishment in play. We see this all the time, unfortunately, with especially with our healthcare clients. So if you have um, health insurance, which I think almost everybody does, a lot of health insurance plans offer some kind of incentive if you do online programs or you go get your blood drawn. Those sorts of things are using external motivation to get you to take action. One step over from that is interjected motivation, and that's when you've internalized that external voice. So external could also be something like a nagging spouse or family member. I always think of when I was growing up, my parents and you know my dad loved cheeseburgers. It was like this favorite food for his birthday, but we'd go out to a restaurant, he'd order something like a cheeseburger, and my mom would be like, oh, you know you're not supposed to have that. That's external motivation, and if he was out on his own, and he heard her voice in his head and didn't order the cheeseburger, that would be introjected. So it's not really his, his own will operating there, it's more like, I don't want to get in trouble. The thing about everything in the dark blue is that if you hit an obstacle, you're going to succumb to some temptation. It's really, really hard to stick with that kind of behavior change if you don't have a meaningful reason that is personal to you. So what we try to do is get people over to the light blue side of this. Um, there's three types of motivation here. Intrinsic is it just feels good for its own sake. That's really hard to instill in people. A lot of times it takes a lot of time and practice. Think about something like physical activity that people who really feel good with it are usually people who have a lot of experience with it. So that's down the road. But what, what we really think about a lot with behavior change design is how do I get somebody either identified so they have a goal that's important to them. It's their goal that they bring into the process. We're not giving it to them. We may help them articulate it and understand it, but it's their goal. And we help them understand how this behavior supports it. And then integrated is doing this is a part of who I am. So what does this person value? How do they see themselves? And again, does this behavior support that in some way? And I'll, I'll talk through some examples of how we can bring this to life. But really, the major goal of behavior change design is to move people from the left-hand side of this continuum as far along to the right-hand side of the continuum as we can. Because what happens is when they have these forms of autonomous motivation, they are more likely to stick with the behavior change over time, even when it's hard. 
So I'm just going to quickly share, these are actually results from a study that a team did. They had this really excellent opportunity to interview the incoming freshman class at West Point. So if you're not familiar with West Point, it's the U.S. Military Academy. It is a really high quality uh, college, so you, you get an excellent four-year college education. But in exchange for that, you agree to serve five years in the U.S. Army. So it's a very, very, very competitive educational experience, but there's a sacrifice associated with it as well. And so they had the opportunity to interview the incoming freshmen at West Point University, and they asked them, why is it you're interested in doing this? And they classified the answers that these freshmen gave in terms of what type of motivation it was. And then they were able to follow up 10 years later and see how did these people do in their military careers after graduation. And so what they found is people who had mostly intrinsic reasons for going to West Point and joining the military, and these are things like, because I believe that it's my patriotic duty to serve my country, those sorts of reasons. They had really positive outcomes. They were more likely to become an officer than people who didn't have these sorts of rationales. They were more likely to be considered for early, to early promotion, and they were more likely to stay in the military past when they were required to. And then conversely, mostly extrinsic, so things like, I don't want to have to pay for college. I'm going to save a ton of money by going to college and, and using, you know, going to military service afterwards. With those sorts of motivations, all the opposite. Less likely to become an officer, less likely to stay on beyond the mandatory minimum. But what's really interesting here is people who said both, and we do this all the time. We have multiple <coughs> reasons for most of the things we do also looked like the mostly extrinsic. They, they were less likely to stay in the military past the minimum required service. What I take away from this, because it's really hard to totally separate out the extrinsic sorts of motivation. Think about your job. A lot of us love our jobs. Would I show up at work if I wasn't getting a paycheck? Probably not. So what I think about this is, how do we emphasize the intrinsic motivational factors, the things that fall more on that aut autonomous side of the spectrum? It's a challenge. It's always about finding that balance. And I just want to be realistic that when we go into behavior change design, we can't really always eliminate these extrinsic factors. It's really hard given the business context that we work in, the clients that we work with, but we do our best. So how do we move people along that motivational <coughs> continuum? I call these the levers of motivation. In the literature, the term that they use is basic psychological needs, or BPNs, but I, I just don't like that term. I call them the levers of motivation a lot of times. And these are three shared basic psychological needs that all human beings have to some extent. We do vary in how much each of us express or feel these things, but we all have them. So the first one is this idea of autonomy. I can make my own meaningful choices. We like to feel in control of our own destinies to some extent. And I'm sure if you think of yourself compared to others in your life, you can see that this is not the same for everybody, but we all need it to some extent. Nobody likes to feel powerless. The second one is competence. So we like to feel a sense of learning, growing, and succeeding. And a lot of times when you listen to somebody who uses self-determination theory talk about this psychological need, they'll point to children. If you look at babies, toddlers, they are incessantly experimenting with the world around them to try to learn new skills and, um, you know, they're trying to crawl, and then they're grabbing onto things, trying to walk. That drive is something that we carry forward into our adulthood throughout our whole lives. We just don't express it quite in such a visible way. So we are always looking to the environment to make sure that we are trying, that we're learning and succeeding and growing. And the third is relatedness, which is I'm a part of something bigger than myself. This could be something like social support or being in a social relationship. I'm connected with another person. But it could also be something like I'm part of a bigger community. I'm not alone. It could be, um, you know, religious faith is something that researchers found can sometimes help people feel some fulfillment around this need. So it can take different forms. So in our design, and what I'm going to show you now is examples of how this can come to life, what we're trying to do is implement features and functionality that support these basic psychological needs, that give people a sense of meaningful choice, that give them a sense of growth, and that give them a sense of connectedness or belonging. So to start is, and I call it perceived autonomy because it actually doesn't matter if they really do or don't have meaningful choice, right? It's do I feel like I do? So it's kind of an interesting twist. But um, the first way, this won't surprise you based on everything I said, is if you can minimize external pressure. And I alluded to this is not always possible. I, I work for a consultancy. You know, we, we, our clients are our bosses. And if you are doing work for a health plan, for example, it's possible that they have a program where they provide incentives to their members to participate in wellness activities. 
and it is a no-go for them to change that. And actually, that, that gets into one of the reasons why incentives are a problem to begin with, because once you implement them, you can't really take them away. The people who received a, an incentive last year for doing something are not going to be happy if it's not around this year. And they're probably not going to be happy if it stays stagnant over time either. So it's a little bit of a trap if you start offering incentives. But let's say you have a client. Your client says, I don't care what you recommend. We're doing incentives. Some of the things you can do is, first of all, try to talk the number down. So too high of an incentive if you're thinking about money, dollars, is counterproductive. There's really interesting research um, that shows that if people are engaging in something pleasurable and getting paid for it, so this is fMRI data, the pleasure centers in their brain stop activating over time. So they actually did this research with video games. They got gamers to play video games. Some of them got paid and some of them didn't. The ones who got paid enjoyed it way less. And then after when they were, they were allowed to play as long as they wanted, they just walked away. So you, you can actually ruin people's interests. How much did they pay the fMRI participant? I know, right? <laughs> Yeah, but by the way, I have never participated in an fMRI study because I'm left-handed, and apparently that means I can't. So, I know, it's very sad. Um, tying rewards to meaningful behaviors, and I will get into this a little bit more when I talk about competence, but making sure that you're rewarding the right behavior is really important. So, rewards can be okay if it's for a one-time behavior. Um, health risk assessments are something that a lot of employers or health plans do. It's a really lengthy questionnaire about all your health stuff. And they use that as a source of data to understand their population. That's not a behavior change tool. If you just want people to fill out the questionnaire one time, it's not a terrible idea to pay them 100 bucks because it doesn't matter if they stay motivated. There's nothing else for them to do after that. But if you're asking somebody to join a walking program where you want them to be taking action three or four times a week, the money is going to be much less effective. So really think about what it is you're trying to tie that incentive to. And then if you can, consider non-financial rewards if possible, and especially if they support that goal. So just to use that walking program example, if you give people who complete six weeks a voucher for a new pair of sneakers, that might be more effective than giving them 100 bucks, even though even if they're monetarily equivalent. You're sending a statement with the sneakers that you're not with the money. Shared rules of engagement is another really important thing. Um, and this is basically about giving people informed choice. So if, if I agree to do something and I know that it's going to be difficult, if I have some sense of what might be hard about it and I still agree to do it, then when those difficulties arise, I'm prepared. And I don't feel like I've been tricked in any way and I'm kind of ready to fight through them. This is a data from a study that a company called Emmy Solutions, it's since been acquired by Walters Kluwer, but um, they did patient education work and they created this video for people who are undergoing a colonoscopy. It was a really detailed animated video that let them know what their experience with the procedure would be like. It's a very unpleasant procedure. There's you know, preparation involved. But they found that patients who watched this video and who were well informed about what was going to happen to them actually needed less sedation medication. Their procedures were over more quickly. And they felt that they were more knowledgeable afterwards. So it was kind of like a win-win um, for them. And you know, they went into this situation basically more cooperative, more prepared, and as a result, they had a more positive experience. So the more that you can be open with people in your product about what they're about to experience, good or bad, the more likely is they'll stick with it over time. And I see this all the time in digital products where people will say, or I shouldn't say people, the product will say, answer three questions so that we can tell you recommendations for where to invest your money. And then you go and it's 13 questions. It's a small thing, but it's a way that breaks people's trust, and if they're not super motivated to begin with, they're more likely to walk away. So that, that honesty, that shared rules of engagement is really important. What if scenarios is also another way to help people make choices meaningful. Uh, this is a really ugly screenshot, but I love this tool. This is the Snowball Debt Calculator. So I use this to pay off my student loans. Um, it's an Excel worksheet you can download it if you just Google Snowball Debt Calculator. You can, and it doesn't have to be for student loans. You can put in all of your debt, how much you owe, what the interest rates are, and then how much money you have available on a monthly basis to pay. And you can play around with different scenarios to see what the payoff schedules look like. And what's cool about this is you can do different things. So for me, I'm really big about checking things off a to-do list. Like, that makes me feel good. And so I knocked off a couple of my small loans quickly because then I felt like I'd done something. That didn't necessarily make sense if you were just talking about paying the least amount of money over time because those small loans were also lower interest loans. But it let me make that choice. So it turned something that, um, I mean, it was still pretty horrible, but 
it turned something pretty horrible into something that at least felt a little bit more fulfilling and a little bit more meaningful in terms of the way I tackled it. And then over here, uh, this is a cardiovascular risk calculator, and it's similar. So what would happen if I quit smoking to my cardiovascular risk? Is this something that I really should do? Does it make a meaningful difference in this outcome? In healthcare, another thing you, you see more of now is shared decision-making. So this is from the Wall Street Journal uh, two years ago. And there are these shared decision-making tools. I'll sh actually, I'll just... This is what they look like a lot of times. So they, they tend to be um, fairly simplified questions that patients can answer in conversation with their doctor. And what will happen ahead of time is the doctor will select a few treatment options that are appropriate for this patient. They sit down, they go through this tool, patient answers the questions, and then the doctor is able to say, based on what matters to you, here's the treatment out of the three that is probably the best fit for you. And there's a lot of concern about these shared decision-making tools in the medical profession because what if the patient doesn't choose the best you know, the best, the best treatment. Like, what if the patient makes the wrong choice? Is it really appropriate to let somebody who doesn't have a medical education weigh in on what we do here? And so the Cochrane Review uh, did a review of studies about shared decision aids, and they found that, first of all, they are no worse off than people who don't use, like, in terms of their medical outcomes, there was no difference. So no better, no worse. But what I thought was really striking is that patients who use decision aids end up with decisions that are consistent with their informed values. And if you think about the qualities, of the motivational quality, that, that means that they are experiencing a more autonomous form of motivation. If you think about somebody who has a chronic condition, um, you know, somebody who needs chemotherapy, for example, which is brutal, brutal. Uh, if they have chosen that because it supports their informed values, they are much more likely to be able to make it through that, that really tough experience. So I, I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind. Letting people pick goals that matter to them is also something that you can build into your product. I've picked a couple of examples. A lot of my examples are from health because that's where my experience has been. I've got some examples from other fields in here as well. Uh, but here, these three are, again, all health. So Pacifica is a mindfulness app, it's, um, and it's pretty good. It does some meditation stuff, and it has a lot of opportunities for you to talk about why you want to um, you know, work on your, your mindfulness. So it allows new users to enter what their overall goal is. So there's not a lot of guidance here, um, but you, know, you, you can enter whatever it is you want, and then that becomes part of your profile. And that exercise at the start of a process, it can be really helpful to get people engaged with it. Noom is, a, and actually, I believe they claim not to be a weight loss app, but they are most certainly a weight loss app. Uh, they actually have a really structured process of helping people think about their goals. So. Um, here they let you talk about how your group coach works with you, which I also think is really important because people have such variety in their preferences for how a live person might interact with them and their product. But they also have a step-by-step -step question set during onboarding where they ask you why you want to do this, and then they say, okay, like, let's think a little bit more about that. Tell me some detail around it. I think there's three or four questions where they finally get you to a very concrete purpose statement about why it is that you are part of, uh, that you, you're choosing to participate. And again, weight loss takes a long time, results may be slow to see, the things you're doing may not be pleasant, you may not be eating the food you love, you may be put, doing your physical activity that is painful or you don't enjoy. And so having that sense of purpose really clearly defined can make a big difference. And then the last one here, Purposeful by Kumanu. Uh, Kumanu is actually a company founded by Vic Strucker, the person who founded the startup I worked for way back when. So um, he has gone on to found this new startup and the entire purpose of Kumanu is to help people connect with their purpose. So this is something you might pair with another behavior change. And it's about helping people first of all say what's important to you and then how do these behaviors help you achieve that. And so the way that they categorize that is who are you at your best self? And then how do these behaviors help you be your best self? And that gets into this idea of value consistent framing. So I mentioned before that a way to get people to be more motivated about a behavior is to show them how it supports a goal that they have or something that's really important to them, something that they value. And so some of that you can do just, just verbally in the way that you talk about a behavior. And I have a bunch of examples here. There's a way that this has been really perverted. <laughs> I see this all the time and I collect these, so if you've seen any of these, send them to me. But have you ever gone to a website and there has been a pop-up and you have to cl click it closed and it says something like, no thanks, I prefer to pay full price or... No, I like to lose money, or I reject my free issue, or no thanks, I don't want to run wild, uh, whatever that may be. 
<laughs> this is actually an attempt to use that value consistent framing. It's, it's an attempt to make you feel cognitive dissonance when you click the no button because they know that most people value saving money. Nobody wants to spend more money than they have to on a product. And so chances are, I mean, this is used so ubiquitously now that I don't know that this happens anymore. But probably the very first time you saw one of those pop-ups and you went to click the, like, no, I want to pay full price, you're like, I don't know. I don't know. This is not a good way to use this because this is such a frivolous behavior. With, with a moment's thought, any person who encounters this can think right through it and say, wait a minute, no, that's, that is not actually supporting my values. There is no need for me to do this. But where you can see more success with this um, is, for example, with smoking cessation. So a lot of people really value being good parents. And if you get into a conversation or you've developed a conversational agent that can even do this, and I, I have actually seen this done with a conversational agent, tell me about what's important to you. Oh, you love playing with your kids. That's interesting. You also smoke. How does that work? You get people thinking about it. And it's, it's one of those things you don't want to push too hard on either because it pisses people off. But if you can plant those seeds... Cognitive dissonance will take over. We feel really uncomfortable when our behaviors and our values don't match, and we know it. So, And it's easier to change your behaviors than your values. One thing people do struggle with, though, is translating their values to action. So this is from uh, Stash, which is an investment app, and it helps people take however much money they're able to contribute. It's intended for beginning investors, so people who don't know a lot about investing their money. And in the onboarding flow, it asks you to pick themes that interest you. And these are really values. A lot of these are values. So um, environment, social responsibility, technology. And what it does is you tell it, what you, you tell it what you value, and then it tells you where you can invest your money in a way that supports those values. So what's nice about this is you hear a lot about people, actually, that are like, I don't want to invest in fossil fuels, or I don't want to invest in companies that make weapons. But we don't, it's really hard to figure out you know, what funds are supporting those activities? And for someone who maybe is interested in saving money for retirement, they don't know a lot about this field, they just give up. So something like this helps them to take those steps that might ultimately benefit them financially and put them into a more secure position. And in general, anything that can help translate um, ambiguous concepts into action plans tends to help people with behaviors. One other thing that you can do to help people is guide them to the right choice. And I put right in quotes because sometimes this is right for your product goals. This is from RunKeeper. It's an older, it's actually older. I, I don't think that this is in the design anymore, but I thought it did a really nice job of highlighting the difference between the preferred choice and the non-preferred choice. So it shows the, the list of benefits that you can see the ones you don't get if you do the basic free service. And then you see that you get all of that and it's shiny gold and much more bold if you pay them per month. Now, is that the better choice? Maybe, depending on what your goals are or if RunKeeper is the right program for you. It's definitely the right choice for RunKeeper to have you pay them instead of not pay them. But just these design choices can, can nudge people toward doing a specific behavior, and it can help them still feel like they are the ones making the choice, which is really important. Just I like this example. It's uh, A lot of people know about it now, but... Um, Volkswagen owns an agency that did this in Norway, so they put piano stairs in on the subway. When you walk on these, they make noise, just like a piano. And they found, of course, that people started taking the stairs instead of the escalator when, when these were here. What I like about this is if you make something fun to do, if you make it attractive, if you put a benefit into it, people are way more likely to do it, and you don't have to ask them. Um, I guess there is a, a Dole logo here, but there's no sign you know, that taking the stairs is better for you, that you should take the stairs for your health, and people are doing it anyway. So it doesn't always have to be about persuading somebody why they do something. It's just about making it more attractive to do. So in terms of competence, which is the next basic psychological need, this is helping people feel that they can achieve something. In psychology, the term you might hear is self-efficacy. So how can you support people's self-efficacy? The first um, kind of broad swath is enhancing user ability. So... Um, I'm, I'm not a huge B.J. Fogg fan, actually. I think that his, uh, his work is really great in terms of digital design, but it doesn't always translate to some of the off-screen behaviors that are often important to achieve outcomes. But one thing he does that I love is he defines ability as the scarcest resource for a user. It's anything that constrains the user because it is a scarce resource. So you can think about time, money, ability, support, whatever the case may be. So these are, are three quick examples of ways that you can enhance user ability. So... Organ donation, um, and this is a really classic example with all the nudge stuff in behavioral economics, but 
making that an opt out instead of an opt in. So when you go get your driver's license, that box is already checked and you have to do extra work to uncheck it. Um, that significantly increases the rates of organ donation. And the interesting thing is in countries where that is an opt out, where that's automatic, they actually don't think of organ donation as as big a deal as we do here. So there's been some recent studies about the attitudes around organ donation and it's like once it becomes the thing that everybody does, people don't feel quite as much, I don't know, attachment, angst about it. So I thought that was really interesting. 401k is a similar deal. Make it an opt out instead of an opt in. So you automatically are enrolled in your 401k when you sign up for your benefits at your employer. It takes a lot of the work out of it. Signing up for these things is, it takes some work. So if you're asking people to do less paperwork, they're more likely to end up in the place you want them to be. And then the third one, that's a mammogram. And this is another study from Emmy Solutions that I thought was really cool, especially as a person who hates to make phone calls. So they did an automated reminder phone call for women who were due for a mammogram. And they did an experiment where some women just got the reminder, you know, hey, you're due with Dr. Smith next month sometime for a mammogram, call to make your appointment. And then other women got the reminder, but at the end it automatically connected them to the scheduling office. And they saw a really significant increase in the number of women who not only made that appointment, but then followed through and had the mammogram. So if you looked at the rates of women who actually had their mammograms, it was much, much higher with that auto scheduler. And what's going on there is it's, it's a very small barrier, right? It's not a big deal to go look up the phone number, but think about resource. Think about the things of constrainability. I have to remember to do it. I might have to go find the phone number. I have to find the time to make the call. Those things get in the way. So if you can take those obstacles out of the way, you're far more likely to get people to the end goal. Along the lines of making it easy, this is another one from Onduo, and this is something we see more and more now as you get more um, sorts of ecosystem products. So Onduo is a diabetes management um, program from Google, and it has connected devices, and as you might expect from a company like Google, it comes beautifully packaged to the user's front door. And they unbox it, and the unboxing it is a delightful experience, and everything just sort of works out of the box and sets up with each other. And um, you know th th that overcomes a lot of obstacles. So the more that you can make something easy at the outset, the more likely people are to do it. Measurement is a really important thing, and just measuring something can change it. So I mentioned before that health risk assessments are not a behavior change tool, but they actually do end up changing behavior a lot of times, which is really interesting. So especially in cases where that health risk assessment gives people feedback, a lot of times they'll be like, oh crap, like, oh, that's not great. And they will make changes even without the coaching or the, the prompt to do so. So these are just a, a couple of different stats from studies that show how just measuring something changes it. So first of all, people who track their food lose twice as much weight. And these are people who are trying to lose weight, to be fair. But, um, and you know, 18% of successful dieters keep a calorie di diary. Um, they're far more likely to be unsuccessful dieters. So just tracking your food brings a lot of awareness to that and makes it easier to change. And then people using pedometers or any sort of step tracker um, keep their physical activity about 27% above what it was at baseline. So anytime you can measure a baseline and share it with your users, bring awareness to the behaviors they're doing now, it helps them understand what changing their behaviors might look like, and a lot of times they'll do it on their own, depending on what that baseline looks like. One thing that may help them change is to compare them to reference groups. So this is an app called Drink Less. It comes out of University College of London. So there's a team there that does research around the behavior change wheel and the COM-B model. And one of the things that they did is they created this app for college students to try to reduce the incidence of binge drinking. And they found when they were doing their research that when they were talking to college students, most of their college students felt that the number of drinks they were having per week was really normal. And if they were actually a binge drinker, that was not true. So part of what this is trying to do is to let binge drinkers know that, no, you're actually drinking a lot. And they, um, they've been using this in a lot of research, and they have found that it does help to reduce the number of drinks that binge drinkers have. So there's a, um, quite a bit of published research around this Drink Less app. Uh, another example here that is very familiar to people is the electric bills that you get that show your usage compared to your neighbors. And one of the things that's interesting is that it wasn't changing people's behavior the way, the way they wanted it to at first. So if you got that report and it showed that you were conserving a lot of energy relative to your neighbors, they found people actually started using more energy. It was like, oh, I can use more and still be doing pretty good. And that's not what they wanted. So they added smiley faces, or frowny faces, depending on where you are. And that made a difference because then it said, like, no, you're doing good, and big smiley face, we want you to keep doing good. 
So it just needed that little bit extra context, not just what you're doing relative to others, but and also here's what we think about it. Feedback is really important, and uh, multiple levels of feedback is something that I like to think about a lot. So this is from Rock Band. And what I like about Rock Band and video games in general is they're, they're really great at giving this multiple levels of feedback. So you can see I've circled on the screen. You get the feedback on the keys that you just clicked. So that's your immediate feedback. Like, what is the thing that I just did, and how well did I do it? And that helps you calibrate for the next, you know, the next note that comes across your screen. But then there's also the running total up in the corner, and that tells you about your streaks, how am I doing over time. You know, maybe I just missed a whole bunch of notes because it was a really difficult part of the song, but I've actually done really well this game. You know, maybe I had a really large streak earlier in the game. This becomes really relevant in a lot of the work I do around health. So if you think again about weight loss, really long process, really hard for people, and we know people slip up, right? If you're on a diet and you're trying to keep to a calorie count or avoid a certain food group or whatever, Oh, nobody can really do that indefinitely. Someone's going to have a birthday party at the office. You're going to come here and see the rotu cheese. Like you're, you're going to eat something that is maybe not on the diet plan. And it's really important in those instances that, yes, you get the feedback that maybe that wasn't a good day. You do need that feedback. But you also need the feedback that overall you're doing really good. And you can get back to doing really good. So that really helps to cushion the blow when people do poorly. So a thing about feedback that can be hard is that if you just give people too much information, we don't know how to parse it. So I have a couple of examples of ways that it can be parsed a little bit more easily for people. So the first one is a startup called MyMe that we did a little bit of work with. And I was actually really interested in MyMe personally. It's um, to help people who have allergies, that undiagnosed allergies, figure out what is triggering their symptoms. And I went through a, a horrible um, like two plus year incident with hives where I could not figure out what was causing them. Went through a lot of testing, a lot of blood draws, like had an MRI, like we never figured it out. Uh, I think I actually, there was mold in the house that I was living in because I moved and they stopped. But I, it was so frustrating and so hard to wake up in the morning and just not feel good and not look good and not know why. And so what MyMe does is it helps people track all sorts of things that could be potential triggers for their allergies but then it connects them on the back end with a nurse who actually plots everything out graphically and can help them find patterns. So it's not a diagnostic tool, but it gives them information that then they can take to their provider and help them get to a result. And it's a re that's a really important thing. Like just having gone through that allergy journey myself, I, this really resonated with me as something that's very important in this world where there are literally hundreds of variables that could be causing you to have allergy symptoms to help you cut through those. Another one is this um, scale called Shape. This actually comes from Dan Ariely, who a lot of people are familiar with. He's a behavioral economist at Duke University. Uh, the scale, that's the scale on the right. You notice anything about it that's unusual? Yeah, no display, no numbers. Uh, I actually use this. So what, the way it works is um, you open up the app on your phone, and the Shape will glow to let you know that it's connected, and you stand on it. It takes your weight, and you just get a color. So it just lets you know, are you, um, so green means you're doing the same. There's two colors for either you've lost a little bit of weight or you're losing significant weight, and then you've gained a little bit of weight, you're gaining significant weight. But the reason that they did this is they were, one of the key behaviors associated with weight loss outcomes, which are really important for a lot of health stuff. I'm not obsessed with weight loss. It's just something that is often indicated for other health conditions. One of the key behaviors that supports weight loss is weighing yourself daily. But people hate it, and they quit all the time because people will gain two, three, four pounds overnight. There's lots of reasons for that. Um, you know, women's menstrual cycles, if you ate a lot of salt, if you had a certain type of workout, sometimes it just happens. So um, in order to help people keep with it, what they decided to do is let's not show them their weight. Let's just show them if there's a statistically significant trend today compared to yesterday. It's actually today compared to the last 10 days. They do a Z-score of the last 10 days. And so they did a clinical trial, and what they found is that people who use the Shapa compared to a regular scale were far more likely to lose weight, which makes sense because they're keeping up with this weighing themselves behavior. So it's kind of a cool way to give less feedback but more meaningful feedback. Another thing that you see a lot in digital around feedback is this idea of badges. I like using the Foursquare badges even though Foursquare is like long gone. It's super pretty. But if you recall the way Foursquare worked, and it's, um, its successor swarm kind of works this way too, you check into a physical location. So you're at a store, you're at a restaurant, you're at a bar, 
You open up the app, you say, I'm here. And if you're the person who's checked in most often there, you would get a badge that says, you're, you know, you're the mayor of this gym or whatever. And if there's themes in the places you check in, you might get a badge as well. Like, you go to more bars than anyone else. Yay. So, <laughs> so one of the things they tried to do, and I think their motivation for this was truly good, was they wanted to do fitness badges. So the idea was you go to fitness-related locations and you log, you uh, check in. And, you know, ostensibly you'd be working out when you were there. No, that is not what was happening. Um, so this is a little bit of an older example. They, they retired these badges in 2012, but um, what they found is that people were going and standing outside the gym and checking in and then heading down the street to the pizza parlor or wherever else they were going. <laughs> and again, this gets back to the idea of rewarding the behaviors that you really want to see. So making sure that the reward is attached to the right behavior and not necessarily the behavior that's easiest to measure. Because people are so attuned to learning and growth, we figure out really quickly what's actually getting rewarded, and then we do the thing that's actually getting rewarded. If you've ever taught, like if you've ever taught a class, you've probably seen this where, you know, you set up your grading rubric and there's something in there that you didn't think was gonna be a problem, but students figure it out right away, and all of a sudden you've got like 35 extra credit assignments to, to grade or something like that. So, um, one company that does this really, really well is Starbucks. So what they want you to do is go to Starbucks and buy coffee. And so what they do is when you go to Starbucks and buy coffee, they make it possible for you to come back and get even more coffee. It's, I mean, it's brilliant. It's, it's dead simple, but it is, they're rewarding exactly the right behavior. And even though the rewards may equate to discounts on your Starbucks product or even free products, it's not really a financial incentive. So it's, it's actually a really elegant feedback system. And... I update this slide as often as I can. They don't push out this data like very quickly, so I wasn't able to find the 2018 data even yet, but their transactions in 2017, they're increasingly coming from the app, so 27% of their total transactions in 2017 are from the app, and this mobile order on pay is now driving 11% of their sales, and at least some of that is because of their reward system. And in fact, Starbucks is becoming too popular so what they're, they're finding now is they're actually having trouble fulfilling the mobile orders at some of their physical sites because there's just unanticipated demand. And then the last thing to think about, um, a lot of things that you ask users to do may actually be difficult, and that's okay, but breaking them down into more achievable steps is the way to get people to stick with them. So um, an example that I really, really like here is this is Duolingo. Anyone use this? <coughs> yeah. yeah, I love Duolingo. They keep changing it, which... Kind of sucks, but uh, the basic idea is still the same. It's a language learning program. And the way that it works is that it creates these trees of skills. And they start from easy and they go to hard. And as you, you basically have to unlock the harder skills by completing the easier skills. And after you've unlocked some of the harder skills, if you go back to the easier skills, they've actually become a little bit more difficult too. They reflect what you've learned in the harder skills. It's a really nice way to divide out a daunting task of becoming conversational in a new language. Or even, I've, I took Spanish all through school, and I've used it for Spanish just to refresh. And even, like, remembering the stuff I learned so long ago can feel a little intimidating, but they make it very approachable, in part because they break it down into these sub-goals. So if you can think about meaningful ways to chunk out the activities you're asking people to do, you can make even harder goals feel achievable. And then the last basic psychological need is perceived relatedness, this idea of showing people how they're connected. And this is, a, um, this is actually from a video game. There's a researcher, Kip Williams, I think he's at Yale now, but um, his research area is ostracism. And he did this series of studies using this video game that he had programmed. Um, the little flipper thing in the bottom is you, that's the player. So it's just a game of catch. And in the first couple studies that he did with this, he wanted to see how it affected people's moods if they got left out of a video game. And so he'd say to them, come into my lab, and we put you in this little cubicle, and there's other people in other cubicles, and you're all playing this game together. And at some point during the game, the two characters at the top would stop throwing the ball to the guy at the bottom. They would cut him out. And then they measure his, the, that person's mood, and the mood was predictably crappy. They would even sometimes start to verge on slight depression symptoms in the measurements. So the next set of studies, they told people, if you're going to be playing a video game against two characters, like it's not real people, it's, it's all programmed. And it was always programmed, it was never three real people. It didn't make a difference. People felt just as upset when it was the computer cutting them out. 
We are extremely sensitive to cues of ostracism. We like to feel connected. We don't want to be the person on the outside. People's minds often go to social media when I talk about this, and I, I just really want to encourage you to think about social media as a tool, not necessarily a solution in and of itself. Social media's value is in actually connecting people, or connecting person to brand is, is something that I have seen done well. Uh, in and of itself, it's not going to solve problems. And in fact, it could exacerbate problems if you're getting low quality connections. So there's some research on things like FOMO, you know, fear of missing out, and the negative effects that that can have on people. That's the opposite of connectedness. So social media can be great, but think about how you use it. Um, one way to use it is trying to be authentic. And these, these examples, I actually pulled these when I was doing some work for a pharma company. And pharma is a really interesting industry because they're highly regulated. They cannot just go on social media and, you know, they, they can't really be funny the way a consumer brand could be, for example. Like, they could never do what Wendy's does. And I don't know that we want them to, but they definitely couldn't. But what they did here that I, I think was really nice in all of these examples is they had something of an authentic communication. So, you know, the, the person who's sitting here behind the social media thing is expressing a little bit of a voice, a little bit of a personality. It's not, you know, particularly memorable necessarily, but it's also not a bland, dry corporate speak. And they are making the effort to engage. So being authentic can help with that. And one thing that J&J &J in particular does really nicely is um, because they have the, baby, the Johnson Baby franchise, they can do a lot of stuff connecting with people about their kids. It's kind of a safe area where they can have these authentic conversations. Being relatable is also a really cool thing that you can do with technology. These are both examples of conversational agents, bots, and I love both of them. So Vivibot comes from a group called the Hope Lab. They're in San Francisco. And this is a chat bot that's designed for teens with cancer. And what they did when they were building Vivibot is they actually um, recruited a group of teenagers who either had cancer or had recently recovered from cancer. And they brought them on a retreat. And they uh, you know, sat down with them and talked to them and learned from them and try to understand what that experience was like. You know, how did they wish they had a friend to talk to them? Because one of the things that they, one of the reasons they started to work with this group is if you're a teenager who has cancer, you I mean you probably don't know many, if any, other people who've gone through that experience. And they heard from these kids that they felt really alone. And so Vivibot actually grew out of that retreat and a lot of the way that it talks is based on the advice that they got from, from those cancer patients. Um, it's accessible on Facebook, so that's that's what the interface is there. And it, I mean, it's really cool. You can chat with it, and it does talk to you in this like super authentic, relatable way. You can tell that there were actual teenagers who had a hands in playing. It is not like the hello fellow kids thing that I would probably do. And then the other one here is a company called Wobot, and that is a bot for mood. So if um, you know depression or low mood. And one of the things I really like about this is it has a sense of humor, and that is so risky to do with technology, but they've done a really nice job. Um, I actually interviewed the um, founder of Wobot for my book, and one of the things she talked about was really trying to figure out what it meant to be funny when you're talking to people who may be struggling with something very serious. And so she talked about being more of a British funny than an American funny, so self-effacing, like, if there's a butt of the joke, it's me, not you. And you can really see that reflected. And this particular one, I was playing around with it, and I said Netflix and chill, and it didn't quite know what it meant. <laughs> I, I was trying to provoke it. <laughs> but they do. one of the things that they find is that, um, and this, this is a more general thing, men are far less likely than women to feel comfortable talking about their mood. And they also experience depression differently from women. And so it may not be detected as easily, like by their friends, their loved ones. Men may be more angry or aggressive as opposed to sad. And so... If you're not trained to know that, you don't necessarily recognize it. And they found that um, you know men are men enjoy Wobot, so that's a, that's a really good thing if you can get a tool out to somebody who may not otherwise have anything. Community can be a really important thing for behavior change. So I mentioned social media. Um, this is sort of an extension for that because it can happen on social media. This is a company called My Health Teams. They build condition-specific social networking platforms. And like the name implies, they're really centered around helping people find the right doctors and providers for themselves. So if you live in a certain city, you have a specific health condition, it can be really hard to pull together that professional support network. But of course, once people get talking about their condition, they, they um, start bonding around other aspects of their lives as well. Uh, one thing I recently learned is that the Couch to 5K running program, it was developed in 1996, and it actually didn't really take off until Facebook became a thing. 
because people started sharing it on social media, it's really easy to share because you can say, I just did week two, day three. Like, it's got a shorthand associated from, with it. And once people started sharing it, they were getting support from others who were also either advanced runners or were familiar with Couch to 5K or maybe doing it themselves. And that was what really allowed it to thrive and become the business that it eventually became. A couple of examples of things that use friends. So um, the first one is an app called Fabulous. This also comes out of Dan Ariely's group. It's a behavior change app. It actually focuses a lot on drinking water, which, you know, okay. Um, the middle one is from a really cool app called Super Better that Jane McGonigal created. She had a serious concussion and needed to recover for about six months, was unable to really do anything while her brain recovered. And so she invented this game called Super Better that was about creating small challenges for herself and then overcoming them with different strategies and by making allies. So this was a way for her to draw social connection into a really solitary experience. And what's cool about this is you can either actually ask somebody if you're, and Super Better has become like a thing now. It's an app that you can use for your own, your own stuff. But initially, this was something she created for herself during her recovery. And one of the cool things about when you enlist allies is you can actually explicitly say like, "Hey, I'm doing this thing called Super Better. I'm trying to achieve something. I need you to be my ally in this way." Or you can just kind of make it up in your head. You don't have to tell somebody that they're part of your game. So I like that it gives people that option. I think it um, plays with different comfort levels there. And then the third one is from Fitbit, so you can challenge people to, uh, to do different things. One of the things that I wanted to come across with here is that the social support piece doesn't necessarily always have to be kumbaya. Like, competition can also be support. So if you're engaging in that activity together and it's friendly competition, that can really encourage people. I mentioned normative feedback before, so showing people what other people do is a way to understand their own performance, and it serves a second function of helping them feel connected, especially when they're doing something hard. So um, smoking is one, smoking cessation. So this, this stat at the top is true. Recent research shows that most people who smoke who are trying to quit, they're going to try to quit about 30 times before they finally succeed. They used to say seven, but then they started um, like looking at what it meant to try to quit. And there were a lot of quit attempts that they weren't categorizing because they were just so short-lived. So they're, they're thinking now it's more like 30. It's, it's really a hard thing to quit. And it helps people to know that you're, you know, you're not alone, you're not the only person who struggles with this. But you have to be careful because it's easy for some people to hear, I don't really need to try that hard. You know, I'm going to fail 30 times, so why do I have to try that hard on try seven? Right? It's, does it even matter? You don't, that's not the message you're trying to communicate. The message you're trying to communicate is you're not alone. This is hard. Personalization creates a relationship. Um, we human beings do something called anthropomorphism anthropomorphize. We're very sensitive to human characteristics and non-human things. And so anytime there's personalization, we start to feel like that object has a relationship with us. So um, that's an old screenshot of Google One, which I desperately miss. It used to tell me like how far I was from the places that I used to go and like all my sports teams and all that stuff. Uh, I don't know why it's showing Facebook stock, but but then, you know, Siri, Alexa, those conversations that they have with you, the human voice, people start to feel a real emotional connection to that. So it, it seems silly because you're not having a deep conversation with them, but you do feel that connection. Or then something like Spotify. So this is some of my daily mixes. And I just love when I pull them up and they really um, reflect the way that, that I feel or, or the type of music that I like to listen to. So just as part of the wrap-up here, a lot of the tactics that I've talked about are about keeping people engaged with the process for a longer period of time. And that's because a lot of behavior change projects are really about things that people need to do for a longer period of time to achieve outcomes. So um, you know, whether it's a health behavior change thing, or a financial behavior change thing, or education usually is something that requires a lot of effort over a period of time. But the fact is that not every product requires that sort of ongoing engagement. Not every behavior requires that ongoing engagement. So just a couple of uh, key points of when this might not be the right focus. So the first of all is when the behavior really happens away from the digital experience. And in, in at least one company I worked on, we found that people would use our product one, two, maybe three times. And our customers would be like, well, you know, what's up? We want them in there 15 times or 30 times. But they were achieving the outcomes we wanted them to achieve. So it was like they, had, they came to the product, they learned what they had to do, and then they went out in the real world and they did the thing. And that was really all we cared about. 
So understanding where that behavior happens and does the digital experience, how much does the digital experience need to be involved in that? Um, what is the right dosage, if you will? The second is behavior doesn't happen frequently, and um, this happens a lot. It, it might be something like making an appointment, um, writing a will. A lot of financial wellness activities are actually one time. So you set up your 401k, and you may not look at that again for several years, and that's totally fine. That's, it's, you're actually going to do better with your investments if you don't keep tinkering with them. So if the behavior doesn't happen frequently, you may not need an experience that is super engaging digitally and keeps you doing something over the long haul. And then the third one, and I, I really feel passionately about this one because I see a lot of people who feel like their product should be a lifetime commitment for somebody. Like, this is the best product and I want you to use it forever. But the fact is that people move on. And if you're successful, they may actually graduate from the product that you give them. I mentioned Couch to 5K before. If someone's run that 5K, they really probably shouldn't be using Couch to 5K after that unless they stop running for a year and they need to pick it back up. But if they run the 5K and they keep running 5K, like, it doesn't make sense for them to stick with the product. And to get back to that earlier point I made about being motivated people, if you can let somebody go gracefully when the time comes, when they have achieved what they needed to achieve with your product, then they're far more likely to refer others to you, to come back themselves if something changes and they need your assistance again. Or if you put out a new product on the market that's more appropriate, they're going to have that warm, fuzzy feeling about you and your company. So to try to keep somebody engaged with something over a long period of time just because you want them in there, that may not always be the right move. So that is it. Oh, and this is uh, the book that I mentioned. I am looking for a different title because my editor keeps making fun of this one. But... <laughs> It's going to be published by Rosenfeld Media probably in January, and if you sign up for the mailing list, you will um, you know, hear about the book release and any discount codes and that kind of thing. So if you, if you are willing to do that, I would really appreciate it. So. So we'll try using another mic for questions. So please raise your hand and I'll run over and ask yeah. a question. Some people talk about uh, EMIs or ecological momentary interventions, which I'm sure some of your apps had, but and for those who don't know things like you may get a text Friday night if you sign up, you know, prevent binge drinking or something. Tell us how those fit into these apps and, and the examples you've talked about. Yeah, I, I've, so I've classified everything according to this self-determination theory framework here, but I think that fits probably most into competence with um, you know, making that connection with a trigger for a behavior and actually noticing it and overcoming it. So what, what you're doing with those sorts of EMIs, or I've also heard eco, ecological momentary assessment if you're collecting data from somebody, which is another way you might use them, um, you're bringing their awareness in the moment because they might not otherwise be consciously thinking about, or they may not be um, summoning the willpower to do something different from their friends. Uh, as, as you say that, though, I'm having a hard time thinking. I don't think that gets used as much as it might. And one of the phenomena that you do see with things like reminders, which is a similar kind of thing, is you see alarm fatigue after a while. So. Um, with medication adherence, you use that kind of thing a lot. Um, send me a message when it's time to take these medications, especially for people who are in polypharmacy and taking multiple medications. And you do sometimes see that alarm fatigue. If there's too many things that they're being reminded of, they start to ignore them. So I, I think it can be a really good tool. I think it just has to be used carefully, and it is not necessarily in and of itself going to be the solution. Our next question back here. First of all, thanks so much for your presentation. I couldn't write fast enough. I wish I kind of just recorded the whole thing. Um, but something that I made a note of when you were talking about measuring a baseline. So with the assessments, I can give an example of something that we saw at work was we were going through this like health assessment where you would answer some questions and get your predicted age according to your uh, current behaviors. And what we actually saw was that some people were so discouraged by their age and by how behind they were compared to their peers that they actually tried to hide or not look at that portion of the website, which was interesting. So at what point do you balance 
how much information can actually be demotivating, but just enough to get someone excited to kind of start and track that journey. Yeah, that, I love that. Um, so when I worked for health media, we had a health risk assessment that gave people a score zero to 100 with a color, you know, 100 being the best. And the number one issue with our, that our call center had to resolve was people who felt that their score wasn't high enough. They would actually call, and they would try to justify, and the poor people on the phone would be like, I don't control the algorithm. Uh, so with that kind of feedback, though, that's a really good point. People do get demotivated if they are really far away from the top achievers. And you see this as well with something like the Fitbit, where you can see how your friends are doing with steps. So if you're connected to somebody who's a marathon runner, and they're wearing that Fitbit while they go out for their training runs, you are never going to take first place on the leaderboard. And that can cause people to drop off over time. And so you can do a couple of things there. So one thing you can do is actually segment out your comparison. So don't show people everybody in the population, but show them people who are similar to themselves. And similar to themselves could mean all sorts of different things. It could just mean the people who are in that same percent, uh, you know, decile as them, for example, in the overall population. So people whose scores are kind of similar to theirs. Or it could be like, I don't know, other women in their age group who are also in that office location. If you, if you um, reduce the size of the pool, chances are they won't necessarily be doing as badly, although, of course, somebody's always in last place. And then the other thing that I've had some success with, you have to have the right data to do this, and the content is a little context dependent, but sometimes you can compare people, um, not even compare. So instead of saying, wow, you have a lot of weight to lose, much more than our average participant, I mean, and that is the case for some people, it really is. Um, what you would say instead is, you seem really motivated to lose weight and you love walking. That makes you similar to 25% of people in our population. So find other ways to draw connections that are not necessarily as stigmatizing or as performance oriented. That can sometimes help as well to create that sense of connection without discouraging people. But yeah, when you do that, just sort of like overall leaderboard or an absolute score, the people who are doing poorly often will feel demotivated, and that's that's a real thing that you have to think about. Uh, next question over here. Okay, thank you, that was a very interesting talk. Um, I'm Herman from Register. Um, so we did use, we also used some generation theory to inform our um, physical activity, activity promotion at the site, and um, families said that they enjoy being able to connect with their children, but then the families also dealing with all kinds of caregiving needs. So mm -hmm. Some families have children, one family has moved to a shelter, uh, one mother with her baby had broken bones. So can we deal with all of this like, difficult like, life hardship? So I wonder how do we incorporate this like, hardship of life into stuff we don't need to Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So part of it is it's not about the theory so much as it's about what's constraining people's ability, right? If you have true hardship in your life, that may take front and center stage for that period of time. One thing you may be able to do through design, and this would take some research and some ability to understand um, your users and perhaps personalize your approach for them a little bit, but if there are ways that you can make the protocol fit into those hardships they're experiencing. So just for, you know, I, I worked on a physical activity program where one of the things we realized is a lot of our users, we were recommending walking. It was intended for people who had no background whatsoever in physical activity. We wanted to start them slow, start them gentle, so start them walking. And we found through research that a lot of our users didn't have access to a safe outdoor space to walk. So when we said, like, go for a walk around the block after dinner, that was a recipe for getting hit by a car. And so what we ended up doing is going back to the drawing board, and we actually asked people to tell us, do you have a safe outdoor place to walk? And if they said no, we had alternative indoor exercise activities that they could do, so like really gentle stretching and that kind of thing. I don't know if, if that is the solution for you, but I think sometimes you do just have to work with the constraints that your users have and understand um, you know, that either this might not be the right time for them to engage in something because they have another really pressing priority in their life, or they need to figure out a way that they can fit it in with that other priority. Um, but yeah, it, so it sounds like that's a really tough situation. Yeah. Our next question back here. Thanks. Thanks for the presentation. I really like the example of where you did automated calls and connected someone. Mm -hmm. And then the channels were, some channels it's easy to have that CTA or the call to action, but in, for a channel like mail, what do you recommend? Like, because, you know, the action, it, it needs a lot.
lot, might need a lot of effort by the user or the behavior might be different. Do you recommend just making a case because it's longer form or still having a very clear call to action at the beginning or something? I don't necessarily recommend longer case. People don't like to read for the most part. Um, there's a lot of data around that. And what seems to help more is if you can make that call to action extremely clear. So not just call to make an appointment, but call Dr. Smith at 617 blah, blah, blah. The more detail you can put, the less work that is on the person receiving that letter in order to follow the instructions, the more likely they are to do it. Uh, if you wanted to include that rationale, that could be something that comes on page two or three, but the call to action should really be front and center. Uh, we, we did a project with medical billing recently looking at people who were not, not experiencing financial hardship but were still not paying their medical bills on time. We found that one of the reasons they weren't doing it is they just didn't understand how much they owed and when it was due. And so part of the solution was actually putting the amount due and the due date in really large print on the first page of the bill. Uh, over here. Thank you for your presentation. Um, at one point, you talked about breaking things down into more achievable steps, and I think a lot about challenge and how challenging things should be. So you don't want them so challenging that someone's going to give up, but if they're not challenging enough, then they're not going to benefit. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to how to find that soft spot or what the soft spot should be? Yeah, so I call that optimal challenge, actually. If it's too easy, people give up. If it's too hard, they also give up, but for different reasons, like bored versus frustrated. Um, I like to look at the concept of flow as a way to think about that, which is uh, Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi's um, concept, but basically it's this idea of really getting into the zone and the rest of the world fades away. And When that happens, it's because you're experiencing optimal challenge. And if you look at the illustrations of flow, I actually I include that sometimes in, a, in this presentation. I'm sorry I didn't today. But one of the things you find is that people actually benefit from moments of higher challenge within the flow state. So the challenging part, for the most part, is achievable. But every now and then, you throw in something that's a little bit harder that they really have to work toward. And because they're already in this state of, um, of achievement, it, it becomes like a way to It's like when you lift more weights, and you know, then afterwards, your fitness has increased. Finding what that is for an individual person takes a lot of subject matter expertise in whatever it is you're doing. There's a, I mean, it depends on what it is. One thing you can do is ask people to self-level. So, you know, seed yourself into the appropriate level of difficulty and go from there. Um, sometimes, depending on what it is, I mean, the SATs and the way that they score those sorts of standardized tests, they have an algorithmic way that they can put people into that kind of optimal challenge. Like, this is the type of question we think you're capable of answering based on what you've answered so far. But it really depends on what exactly it is you're asking people to do. And right here. So you went over a lot of specific behavior change design strategies in the talk. It's really, really nice. And I'm just wondering, excuse me, I'm just wondering how much of this is actually the novelty effect mm -hmm. in terms of this is new, people are really impressed by it, but it does not actually touch what Ryan and Desi have talked about in the self determination theory. Yeah, well, one of the reasons I like to use self-determination theory so much is it has a really robust body of research behind it. And, um, you know, I mentioned selfdeterminationtheory.org, but they, have, they continue to have a really active group of collaborative researchers who are looking at applying self-determination theory to digital design, um, you know, from digital health to video games to ed tech. So there, there is empirical, peer-reviewed research that shows that a lot of this stuff actually works. And then, in addition... I've seen, I mean, most of the stuff that I've put in here, I have some kind of evidence base for. So I, I guess I don't know for a fact that it's not novelty, but it's persisted at least long enough to produce results that are quality enough for the literature. So I have some confidence that it's tapping into something real and not just something that's new. Does that answer your question, or am I? Um, I'm just talking about, since a lot of them are based on publication, and mm -hmm. publication affects, of course, people are looking for something really, really interesting. Oh, yeah, yeah. But people usually don't repeat Yeah. To what extent is this, because it's never happened before for me, mm -hmm. versus this really touching my intrinsic motivation or this autonomous motivation? Yeah, I think that probably varies on some of the examples. Like those pop-up ads are a good example of something that is going to be just a novelty effect. But a lot of the better made behavior change programs are built to have more of a relationship with people. They're, they're intended to be something that people use over a period of time, and so they won't get away with novelty for very... Their users will drop off earlier than they should if it's just relying on the novelty effect. 
So it's a little bit of like the market sorting it out, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Hi, thanks a lot. Um, I work a lot in bringing digital health technologies into low middle income countries. So I'm curious in your experience, uh, how much of these results or, or findings are, you know, how, how do they play out in other cultures? Mm -hmm. So from a self-determination theory perspective, the cross-cultural work they've done has shown that for the most part, the theory holds up across cultures. The one area where they see consistent differences is how people experience autonomy, that meaningful choice. And the specific difference they find is that in some cultures, people um, feel more comfortable with like a family level choice, like having their parents or their significant other be part of the decision making. Where in the United States, for example, most people think of it as a very individual thing, like it's got to be me. But then separate from that, another thing um, that we see in other countries is that, or you know, populations that maybe are not, don't have as much money, is they don't always have access to the same sophisticated technology. So I've done some work, for example, in India in cities that where internet connections at home weren't as common. And so one of the things that we had to do was adapt our digital intervention to use a diabetes educator who was in the clinic as kind of an intermediary. So we went and did some ethnographic research, realized that the patients that we wanted to reach were never going to use this program online on their own. They didn't have the means to do that. And so instead we had to think about how do we deliver this interve intervention to them through a different method. So in my experience, sometimes it, it just takes, you can't make assumptions that the way the product works in one area is the way that it makes sense to work in another, and you need to be flexible about the, the delivery method. And uh, last question over here. Oh, <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Okay. It's going to be a little off topic. Um, hi, I'm Erin. I'm a building designer and technologist, uh, user-centric design and user research. And I thought that the three levers of motivation that you had as far as autonomy, competence, and relatedness applies directly to a lot of our research around sort of autonomy, being supporting choice, allowing users to choose what space to use. Mm -hmm. Competence, knowing your way around, intuitive wayfinding, and relatedness, I belong here, I can see myself entering the space. Does, is that sort of like, does motivation track to desirability, both in UX design or space design, or sort of what people want to interact with? Yeah, I haven't ever, as you were saying, I was like, of course it does. I haven't ever yeah. looked at it one-to-one -one in research, but, um, I would say yes, because we, we can look at other metrics, like, for example, how long do people use something? And we do have data that people will use something longer if it is built to support their basic psychological needs, and they perceive it to be doing so. So you have to have that check in. Like, do you think this is supporting your competence, your autonomy, your relatedness? And when people say yes to those things, they do tend to stick with whatever that thing is longer. There is also some evidence from education. So they've, they've done a number of studies like, did this teacher support your basic psychological needs? And they found um, some evidence there that would also suggest that there's a liking effect. It, ma it makes sense, I just don't know for sure that the data exists. Yeah, it, it, it seems convenient, but it's okay. It's all very non-scientific within our architecture anyway, so we can, we can call it desirability. But it was just interesting how it seemed to track with what we're hearing from what people like out of spaces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I have my email and my Twitter handle up here, so please feel free if you do have questions you want to chat. Um, you know where to find me. Thank you very much.